So how, do, so, so how would you resolve conflict in, in a relationship? Well, let's go to Matthew 18, 15. Because, you know, when you resolve a conflict in a relationship, in a marriage, it's no different to any other relationship. It's no different to any other conflict. You know, so there aren't special rules for marriage. There aren't special rules, you know, just because you're married to somebody. It's just more important that you put them in place, remember, because you spend a lot more time together. And you spend every waking moment with each other. There's just more opportunity for conflict to happen. And that's why even more so it needs to be applied in that relationship. Matthew 18 says in verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So that's the first step, is that you talk to them about it alone. Now, this is very important in a relationship in marriage because, I mean, number one, you know, it, it, you, you don't want to be aggressive, you know, when you confront them alone. You know, so don't be aggressive. Remember we talked about the soft words, the soft answer, um, you know, being quick to hear, slow to wrath. So don't be aggressive. But... The, the point I just want to emphasize here is that you go to your husband or your wife alone. So your first point of call when you have a conflict is not your sister, not your best mate, not your colleagues at work, not your mom, not your dad, not everybody else, not Facebook, right? Like don't have a conflict and then post a status update and say, oh, my husband, I can't believe he did this. No, your first point of call is meant to be you and him alone, right? Because that's the most important relationship. Once you start going out of that first, you're just further degrading that relationship because now when you have a problem, you're not going to each other. You're going to somebody else. So don't talk about your marital problems to all your friends. Uh, and first and foremost, obviously, you know, you've dealt with it, you know, because I tell you about my marriage problems, right? But it's because I've dealt with them with my wife already. And it's things that I'm, I'm, I'm okay sharing with you. Um, so go to them alone. Don't talk about your marital problems to all your friends. Definitely don't put them on social media. Um, you know, and have some, you know, and, and you've got to think about, have some respect for your spouse. You know, like you wouldn't want, you know, I'm sure like, you know, ladies and guys, you have a best friend. Yeah, I'm sure your best friend doesn't appreciate you sharing all your secrets with everybody else. And it's the same thing with your marriage. You know, you have issues in it. You know, have some respect for your spouse. You know, you want other people to think well of your spouse. You know, it's like with, it's like with God, right? You know, with the way we talk about God and the way we... It's because we want people to think well of God. You know, we want, people to, we want people to uplift Him. It's the same with your spouse. You know, you want people to think well of them. So when you talk about your spouse to other people, you want it to be generally positive. Because you don't want you want to respect and honor them as as your partner. So have some respect for your spouse. Deal with it privately, and and you know, number two, keep the bedroom private as well. You know the Bible says that the, the the marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. Sometimes people will ask, well, what what are you allowed to do in a marriage in terms of phys physical intimacy? Well, we can say what the Bible says, right? The marriage bed is undefiled. So in in my opinion, it's, it's the green light on on anything. Anything that a husband and wife wants to do, they can. It's none of my business. It's none of your business. And, you know, that's why don't, I don't think we should really talk about it in detail with other people. Because I, I remember seeing a, a lady on Facebook. She posted like, you know, oh, my wife, my husband wants me to do this. Is that okay? Well, I think it's wrong, first of all, to even ask the question. Because it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done to them in secret. And, you know, when it, comes, when it comes to giving advice, this is why when I preach on physical intimacy, you don't see me going into all the different methods and techniques and everything like that because it's inappropriate. And we don't need to because the Bible says the marriage is honorable and all and the bed undefiled. That's all we need to know. We just need to know that between a husband and wife, they can do whatever they want. Their bodies belong to each other and it's up to them what they want to do. So definitely do not put conflict on Facebook and definitely do not talk about your bedroom life on Facebook either on social media because that's between you and, your, and you and your husband. Have some respect because you may think, oh, you know what, I'm just asking my, my friends what they think, but will your spouse honestly think the same thing? You know, they may not want their other people to know what you guys get up to. So keep it to yourself. Uh, please, please, uh, oh, I, I put here, people ask about what is allowed in the bedroom and I just put, you know, the bed is undefiled. So that's the first step. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. 
if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So, so if you can, that's where I talked before, that if you can resolve that conflict, it's going to build that relationship. It's going to make it stronger, isn't it? You're going to gain your brother and you're going to be even closer. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So if you need to escalate, then you talk about it with a couple of people. So they need to be present. It's not go talk about it with a couple of people with them not present, right? Because it, it, it needs to be fixed with this person. And it's the whole idea there is so that people can't say, oh, they said this and they said this and there's all this hearsay. So the whole idea is, is there's a group of people now, either maybe, I guess with the two people, so either three, four or five people to talk in the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word may be established. And if she, he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. So then you then take it public, right? You approach the church and the, the person then is publicly shamed in church, right? To say, hey, they're doing this and they need to stop. Um, and then it says here, tell it unto the church, but if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So those are the points of escalation and no other. So we need to make sure that we handle conflict correctly. So we confront them alone, number one, then we confront them with one or two witnesses. Then number three, they, they are publicly confronted in a church setting or in a larger group. And then number four, they are actually kicked out of the group and treated as an unbeliever until they repent and they get right, right? And they, and they, and they are sorry for it and they attempt to do what is right. Now, the reason why I'm just bringing us to this, because obviously we can use this for any conflict, but I just wanted to apply it back to the domestic abuse example, because some people have that question of, you know, how do you, how do you deal with domestic abuse? If you're trying to do what's right, you can't resolve it. What are the steps you would take? So this is my opinion on, on it, right? So with the domestic abuse example, Number one is, you know, when it says go between him and thee alone, that means I, don't, I personally do not believe you go to the police straight away. I don't know if that gets me into trouble. You know. Does this get me in trouble in Australia? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, do not go to the police straight away. You have a method on how you are to deal with conflict, right? And this is how you should deal with it. It does not mean we don't go to the authorities at all, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? They don't go to the authorities of all, at all, even though there's report after report after report of, of ch child abuse and sexual abuse, right? They don't even go to the police at all to, to, to put these guys in jail, at least. But, so you don't, don't go straight to the police. Why don't you go straight to the police? Because man's laws are unjust, right? And they're not always the right thing to do. I mean, man's laws can conflict with God's laws, right? Especially in Australia, you go to the police and then you take out an AVO, Right, and now you, can't, now you can't even talk to each other. Now the husband can't even try and approach the wife to make amends because he's breaking the law. So if you go to the police first, you're actually going to make that relationship even worse. And, and you know, the, the law is not always on our side. They're not, they're not trying to amend a relationship. They're just trying to keep people safe. Right, they're not trying to fix a relationship. God is interested in fixing a relationship. That's why he has this method of resolving conflict. So man's laws can conflict with God's laws. You've got AVOs, um, you know, false accusations. That it, you, know, you know, the government sometimes is more destructive than it is restorative to a relationship. You know, because what happens if they, they arrest the husband and put him in jail for a couple of weeks? How is that helping the relationship? You know, be apart for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and not only that, man's laws can be biased. Man's laws can be biased, especially in Australia, towards the female, right? So we, 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 we don't go straight to the police. We need to, you need to deal with it between one and another. But let's say, for example, a woman is being abused. Let's, let's say the rare example, she's doing everything right, she's still being abused. She's, she's tried to approach him about it in a, in, a, in a soft way. He's still doing it. Then, you know, she tells either family or people in church, every, everyone confronts him, you know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And he says, oh, you know, I'm not going to do it anymore, whatever. Um, but he continues to do it. There's no, there's no change in behavior at all, right? So now what do we have to do? We have to escalate it again, don't we? So now it's brought to the attention of the church. It's, it's, he's publicly shamed and everybody knows this is what he's doing unless he repents. Now, let's say he doesn't repent. 
and he's still doing it, right? She's still, she's still, you know, under threat of harm. Now what? Well, now that we've gone through those three levels of escalation, what does the Bible now say? It says here, if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Because remember, a lot of people will say, don't go to the law first, because in 1 Corinthians 6, it says you don't sue another brother, right? So that's one reason why we don't go to the unjust court system or the unjust laws or, or call the police with un who are enforcing unjust laws sometimes to, to deal with conflict. But when it's gone through the necessary escalations, now the Bible says, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So isn't that interesting? Because you can sue an unbeliever, can't you? You can take an unbeliever to court. You can take an unbeliever to the police. So that's why I think there's this escalation level here where it's alone, two or three witnesses before the church, because the idea is that through those escalation points, number one, it's trying to restore that relationship. And then number two, you know, in an ideal world, the church should be enforcing God's laws and trying to support that relationship and, and, and judging righteously. And if he still will not hear that, then we go to the authorities. And then, you know, we pre you, know you press charge or you do whatever um, is required to the court system. And it's the same with any conflict. It'd be like if somebody owed you money, right? Like if somebody owed you a lot of money or they, they borrowed money and didn't pay you back, you could go through this escalation, couldn't you? Because people say, well, you know, how, how can I get my money back if I can't sue him? Well, you should ask for it back first. If he doesn't give it back, then you go in the mouth of two or three witnesses and he still is not willing to try and pay it. Then it's brought before the church and if he's still not willing to pay it back, then you can sue him because now you're treating him as an unbeliever and you can't sue an unbeliever. So that's how I, in my mind, make sense of, of that escalation of dealing with conflict. So you should, you should only not sue a brother or sister in Christ once you have gone through these three steps. So if you haven't gone through these three steps, then you aren't able to go before the law, before the unjust to get judgment. I don't think it's, it's a good idea. So what should be the punishment for a man who physically abuses his wife? I, and this is my last point. What, what should be the punishment for a man who physically abuses his wife? Because you might say, well, the man should be fined. $10,000, $20,000. This is what I mean by unjust law, because I don't know what the punishment is in. Ashton, do you know what the punishment is for a man that... Oh, it can be fine, but it can be like a jail sentence. So, so it can be, so okay, so now I've got these two here. So it can be a fine or it can be a jail sentence. See, this is why you don't go first to the law, because that's their two options, right? Their two options is they either fine the family or they throw the husband in jail. Now remember when I said to you that like laws often are destructive. They're not restorative. Because number one, if you fine the family $20,000, how does that help the family? You know what I mean? Like, okay, the husband just abused the wife. Now you're going to take $20,000 away from the wife? Because, I mean, that money is probably supporting her as well, right? And then what's the other option? You throw the guy in jail. So now, now the children don't even have a father. Now the, the, the woman doesn't even have a, a husband to take care of her. You know, so how is that restorative? How does that even help the situation? It just makes it worse and it just destroys that relationship. So what should be the punishment? Well, I think according to the Bible, he should probably get a beating. You know, because it's not, it's not, probably not a crime worthy of death. You know, you're not gonna, he's not stealing anything, so he's got nobody to, to pay back money to. And the only op other option in the Bible is that he's beaten. And I guess the physical beating that you'd get from the government is a lot worse than, you know, just a spank on, on the bottom. So I would say when, when, a, when a man is beating his, beating his wife and, you know, she's done everything she could to keep the peace, she's gone through these escalation points and now it's gone to the law, a righteous government would then take that man and beat him. Whatever they feel is just in that, in that the judge would decide, right? And that's what the punishment should be. All right, so anyways, I, I, I don't know if that went a bit off track, but I hope that was interesting to you. So just remember the last tip was to confront and overcome conflicts and challenges. So hopefully that gave you a few practical tips and a few stories to help you remember that. All right, let's pray.